So hello, everybody. Um, welcome to the first full day of the um, Digital and Archival Approaches to Theater History Conference. We had a great keynote yesterday that started up some wonderful big questions and discussion. And we're so grateful to the funding of the NEH for funding both last night and the full day of theater history conversation today. Um, so first up um, in our morning session is Paul S. Ulrich. Um, he's flown here all the way from Berlin, so I think he gets points for the, the farthest uh, travel to get here to Philly. Um, he is an American who was born in Pennsylvania, was a librarian at the American Memorial Library in West Berlin, um, which was uh, fused with the Berlin City Library and former East Berlin to become the Berlin Central and Regional Library. Um, he served as the head of the library computer system there and was transferred to the reference department where he was instrumental in introducing Question Point to Germany. He's uh, now an independent theater historian, and in that capacity, he has compiled the Biographical Index for Theater, Dance, and Music, uh, Master Index of German Language Biographical Directories and Yearbooks. So I've put some of his work out on the table, so you guys are free to pass that or those books around and look at those indexes while, while he's talking, so you get a sense of um, the great work he's been doing, which he's going to be telling us more about. Um, he's expanded the, his database of the information in the index with information on all the staffs of German theaters from 1836 to 1893. Currently, um, the University Library in Frankfurt Mann is, the process, is in the process of migrating this database to the internet. He was the editor of SIPMOS, International Dir Directory of Performing Arts Collections and Institutions, until his retirement in 2009, and has published extensively both on library topics as well as German language theater. Um, since 2005, he's been the president of the Society for Theater History. Um, and since his retirement, he has been cataloging the Playbill collection of the State Library in Berlin. Um, he's also cataloging the Playbills of the Menningen Court Theater from 1831 to 1907 and comparing them with the repertories in the journals of the Menningen Theater. So he's been up to quite a lot, and we're really looking forward to hearing more in his presentation. Thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very, very glad to be with you. Uh, after listening to the talk last night, I realized that we're doing a lot of work with playbills, talking about ephemeral of theater, but most of everything we're I've heard up to now has been what's happened basically from the point of, let's say, the audience and whatnot. What about all the ephemera which is related to the uh, performance, which you never hear about? theater rules and regulations within the companies and from the, the government and whatnot. Uh, trade union rules, uh, fights over uh, payment, uh, technical uh, advances in the theater and how they affect what happens on the stage, uh, size of audiences, uh, what, what are the seating situations within the theater. All these are other aspects which aren't dealt with very much. Also, the problems with interaction with music. Uh, the, uh, strangely, the theater historians know nothing what music, musicologists are doing, and musicologists have absolutely no idea what theater historians are doing, uh, and uh, literary people have no idea what both of them are doing. So, <laughs> uh, what I'm gonna be, I'm gonna have to uh, cover a lot of territory today. I have to basically go through everything I've been doing because it's all very, very tied together. It all began when I came to Germany and was aghast at how poor or how difficult it was to get information on German actors and people involved in the theater. And I began, and I realized that the German yearbooks, the theater yearbooks, had a lot of information, but nobody knew about them. Uh, and I began to go through and compile a listing of where this information was. It was published initially in a smaller uh, two-volume version in 1984, and uh, then was republished in a much extended fashion, a version, in 1994. This uh, biographical directory, which we'll see later on, is a standard reference work in Germany. 
Matter of fact, if you go into the German uh, National Authority file and, find, and look at, at actors and other people involved in the theater, you'll just see my family name listed there as a source. Let me see about this, okay. Wait a second. Okay, my main point of interest is almanacs, journals. Uh, I make a major distinction between the two terms, although it's got nothing whatsoever to do with what's on the t title page. Uh, the, the use of the two word terms are all over the place and they make absolutely no sense. For me, for an almanac is a publication. It may be a serial publication, it may not be. Uh, it was generally intended to be a serial public publication which covered numerous venues in generally in numerous cities. The journals are publications dealing with one company, one city. Uh, in, okay, I've got, also got to say what I'm talking about now is primarily German theater up to the end of the First World War. At that point, there's a change in the structure of the uh, German theater, uh, but we won't go into that. And the person who published these journals was not the director of the theater generally, it was the prompter. The prompter is a very, very interesting figure in German theater. Uh, after 1836, some of the major prompters became theater agents, and they basically controlled not only what actors went to what companies, but also what plays were performed in what companies. And there's also, to be assumed that there was some sort of interaction between the two. You want this actor, well then you better do some of my plays, or, if I come, or vice versa. You also have statistical uh, retrospectives. You've got a few biographical yearbooks, and you've got the so-called dramatic po uh, pocketbooks. These are just anthologies of plays, have no direct bearing on the professional theater whatsoever. I mentioned the various uh, publications I did. These are the two. The first one, the theater, dance, and music in the German yearbook, and then the biographical index on, the, on your right. The Deutsches Bund Jahrbuch is, uh, is the main stage yearbook. Uh, in the next few days, the 127th edition will be published. Um, it's got numerous titles. Actually, it began publication in 1871. And up to before that time, there were a few other ones. Now, we talk about German cities. I mean, this is going to be a major problem of what um, these big volumes going around are part of the problem, the things I'm going to be talking about. When you talk about the number of, ci of cities in Germany where theater was performed, or even outside of Germany, you notice something very interesting. They aren't being played in towns with a large population. Matter of fact, Philadelphia, at the end of the 19th century, had more Germans than almost every German city in Germany. Uh, <laughs> and this is an interesting thing because when you start also looking at the number of seats, oh, well, first of all, the number of theaters being built all the time, and we're talking about permanent theaters. It's another problem I've got. People talk about per permanent theaters, and I don't know what they're talking about. Because most of these companies didn't perform in a permanent theater. They performed in hotel rooms or in uh, uh, restaurants or any other location, very seldom, but only rather late in the 19th century were even theaters being built. And all of these theaters, with the exception of some court theaters, were privately run. And you see the number of seats, most of them under 700 seats. Strangely enough, the number of seats available in th most theaters in Germany today has not changed. The population has been a tenfold. <laughs> now, in, I, I'm going through and uh, documenting the venues in these al universal almanacs. And the books that are going around here are part of an extensive documentation. In, and I'm only documenting what are in these yearbooks. In these yearbooks, I have a total of 4,265 towns where I know German theater was performed. That Germany has got so, two, over 2,000 is not surprising. 
The next two are rather surprising because they aren't in the German-speaking area today. It's in the Czech Republic and in Poland. And most, most of these towns, which I would know about, were towns which were visited by traveling companies. Then Austria comes along with 320, France 158. This is because, on the, particularly on the eastern border of France, uh, at various times it was part of Germany. And then 139 towns in the United States. And after that, starts, everything starts dropping off very, very rapidly. The ones in the United States, a lot of them were places where only visiting companies came through, but there are a surprisingly number of cities uh, which had German theaters. Now we talk about, let's do some more statistics. Number of universal almanacs, somewhat more than 200. The number of towns mentioned, 4,265. The number of local journals. This is a major problem. At the moment, I know of somewhat more than 6,000 of these journals. They're only from 300 towns. That means, just if we start looking now, 4,000 towns had them, and only 300 towns are represented by the journals. That's only 8%. I assume, since most of these journals were published by prompters at their own cost to get additional pocket money, there were probably over 100,000 of these journals published. And Sarah mentioned the problem of all these locations and whatnot. I've got even be more problems with finding these, these, because you find them everywhere and very often not where you expect for them to be found. The almanacs, they list the companies, being uh, companies with, and very often have plays in, uh, printed, literary text, poems, biographical text, chronologies of the past season, their illustrations also, sometimes reviews, and particularly at the end of the 19th century, information about professional organizations. When you talk about the companies, there's a, a very often, especially at the end of the 19th century, information about the town population, uh, about the venue, when it was built, the number of seats, how of, of a staff, often with the, where they lived, the new plays in, yeah, the new plays in repertory, who visited them, hotels which are recommended or other places, to, localities they can go, illustrations, reviews, and newspapers with which critics were there. Now you've got to know that critics of the newspapers in, the, in German, the, the German towns expected actors to come and visit them, otherwise the reviews might be rather detrimental to them. Uh, furthermore, the newspapers very often expected them to subscribe to the newspaper, even though they were only in town for a few days, simply otherwise no mention in the newspaper. Here are just some of the title pages of some of the almanacs. This is the theater calendar from Gotha, one of the very popular, uh, very well-known uh, almanacs. Actually, it appeared in two different versions. These are identical, well, the two years are not identical, but the Taschenbuch and the calendar. The difference is that the calendar had a calendar in it, but not every town, every geographic uh, area allowed you to have publish a calendar. And consequently, they removed the calendar and published it in the other title. <laughs> okay, these are the two of uh, uh, other uh, uh, almanacs. These, uh, this is the Almanac, again, 1836. This is when I have totally, I've done the total uh, entry of all the uh, staffs of the uh, theaters in this. And this is Wolf, who began this uh, almanac, was the pr uh, former prompter at the Court Theater in Berlin. And after, after several years, it was changed to the Deutsche Bühne Almanac. Parallel to this, uh, there is Ferdinand Röder's Theater Kalender. Röder was a director who later became an agent. And then the Society for German, uh, the German Stage, Act, uh, Stage Personnel U uh, Union in 1873 began publishing their own. And this is the predecessor of the current German stage yearbook. These are a few other almanacs which are, uh, were published. And there was one almanac published only for America, only this once in 1860. And this is a typical 
uh, listing which you found in, in this uh, one was for Philadelphia. As I say, the prompters published these uh, and became, the I've mentioned all this before. Now, on the left hand side, you see a almanac from Milwaukee and Chicago. What's interesting about this almanac is where it was found, namely in my library in Berlin. And I've got no idea how it got there. As far as I know, nobody in Milwaukee or Chicago knows about this. <laughs> and on the right-hand side uh, is one which uh, I found at the uh, German Society here in Philadelphia. When I said the problems of titles, this is just the beginning of the easier titles which I run across. It begins even more strange when I start getting all these titles, <laughs> or these titles, or these titles. And here you can see on, on the right hand side a typical one March flowers. Who expects anything here serious? <laughs> or here. This one here on the, on, the left, on, on the left actually almost could be considered a playbill except it's part of a journal. And what do you do with this? This is a broad, it's a broadside. Uh, in the museum where it's kept, it's kept only because of the illustration of the middle. There's no title, but if you look at it closely, you find uh, the things which are, make it very much a theater journal, namely, on the left and the right hand side, you have a full chronology of what was performed that year. And down below, you have a listing of the cast. As I say, and you don't find this in any library catalog. As I say, it's, a, it's, a, it's kept as an illustration in, a, in this Bitcoin area. The contents of the journals, they've got a company. They've got a listing of the repertory. Matter of fact, this listing of the repertory is probably the best, most uh, concise example of what was performed at that theater. Let's not forget playbills. Tell us what we're, they're intending to, to perform. Nobody says that they were ever performed. Now, for example, I did an a interesting uh, chronology of German language, of German theater in Berlin, or theater in, or, no, of public performances in Berlin in 1848. This is also, it's on the web, at the website of the, of the Society for Theater History, but it's also been published. Uh, I think a copy of that is in the, uh, free Library. I think I saw it there and listed there, of uh, the year 1848. Interesting is, uh, it's not just the plays. It was concerts, monkey theater, circus, anything which the audience was invited to come. The Anatom Anatomical Museum, the big. And if you look here, on the 18th of March, 1848, there was the revolution. Outside the theater, of course, the revolution going on, there was not, no production being performed. So if you look at the playbills, there was a scheduled for a, a performance that day. If you look in the newspaper at the, the announcements of something being scheduled, forget it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, they're often very often poems. Uh, these poems are very interesting. Very often they are referred to as uh, prompters and whatnot. Uh, Matter of fact, one poem, what Sarah mentioned yesterday about keep things keep being redone and redone. There's a theater journal in 1928 in the town of uh, Gera, which reprinted a poem in the hourglass form. And they said how unique this poem was. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. <laughs> Up to now, I've been able to discover 75 copies of this poem with absolutely almost no variation from 1826 up to 1918. Uh, one of the, the poems I, I, I saw at the German Society uh, Library yesterday, the end had sections of poem which these prompters did in all over Germany, and anecdotes. This is, the, this, is this uh, poem in the, as I say, there are slight variations every now and then. A word has changed, the punctuation has changed, but it's basically always the same. Okay, 
Now I've made this great big collection. Okay, I've got four and a half thousand of them in my own private collection at home. Some of them are original, a lot of them digital uh, photocopies. And I was been asked several years ago by the Don Juan Archive in Vienna whether we wanted to make them. They have been, in, in the meantime, all digitized in Vienna. And the Don Juan Archive has created an OPAC <coughs> where this, uh, the journals can all be at least searched, as far as the title. We are now in the process of compiling this huge documentary, documentation of the German theater. At the, mo at the moment, we're only doing regional volumes. I brought three of them. The one in Vienna, which has been published, one on Southeast Europe. The one on the Czech Republic, I didn't bring, because it was bigger than the two of them together. <laughs> And I very quickly finished this one up on the Americas, not just the United States, but everybody in the Americas. Uh, I also have one which is being prepared at the moment of Northern Europe and Poland will be followed. At some point there will be one on Berlin, which will be bigger than the Vienna volume and numerous other ones. When that's all finished, it'll be compiled because when you start, well, we'll get to that later. And then uh, there will also be, okay, I've got five minutes. Okay, I've got to hurry up. Um, Okay, what is, in, or, or, or what is the structure of these documentaries? The venues, the venues in, adjacent to Vienna, uh, touring companies with, which were housed in Vienna, touring companies which performed in Vienna, the itineraries of the directors. That means not only the itineraries when they were in Vienna, but everywhere, from the whole documentation which I'm doing. It means if you look in, in, under the list of these directors, you'll find towns listed. If you want to know more about them, you're going to have to wait until the other volumes are published. <laughs> or we'll wait until the complete collection is published. Uh, there are theater journals without a repertory, the chronological repertories of the Viennese theaters, the Viennese news, uh, the prompters who produce the, 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 the journals, newspapers listed in the almanacs, and the editors and critics. Okay, I've talked about all this. Okay. Now we're talking here primarily about theater, Playbills. I've got a colleague in Berlin who was uh, instrumental in having the playbills of the theater, German theater in Königsberg, which is now part of Russia, which is used to in Prussia. And they were in the Academy of Arts. It's an incomplete collection. And we talked to him, I said, Can you, have you checked what's happening in the theater journals? And he didn't, I didn't know about I gave him a copy to them was able to fill up most of the gaps which were there. Matter of fact, for example, both in the student library here and in the uh, German society, uh, you have something very similar. These journals are not cataloged. They're put, to put together at the front of the playbills as an index to the playbills. OK, this is, uh, the, the, uh, this is the website where the Königsberg Theater Journal uh, are published. Okay. So I mentioned I'm doing cataloging the playbills in the State Library in Berlin. Which I'm doing it somewhat more differently than in every, any other place I know. Where I am not just cataloging the title. I am cataloging or listing all the roles and who was performed and attaching the name of those performers an anti-biographical entry in the German National Authority file. As a matter of fact, in that North, I generally use, for the most of the part, my own biographical index to uh, provide this biographical material there. Um, we talk about things on the playbill. Now, I have another one of the side issues that I got is theater rules and regulations. If you look here, at the very bottom, there's a small little notice. And that says, the actor Ludwig Debian, who said a very big time, very famous uh, German actor, is sick. Now, why put that on a playbill? For a very simple reason. If an actor is sick in Germany, he is not allowed to go into the public. He gets, he gets uh, fined if he does that. This is the reason why it's, it's not there because it's not because why he's not performing. Because you're not allowed to go on the streets. Right. 
This, by the way, is uh, the junior uh, playbill for the Freischutz, which is done in Berlin. And you also see a small little thing tomorrow, no play. And this is basically the entry in the, in the state library. The, catalog, the, the playbills I've cataloged are all in the OPAC there. So if you go to one of the actors there and click on that, you will also see all the plays we was in. Yep. This is uh, the Merchant of Venice in, in Leipzig. Uh, which of all these are other ones I've. This is, okay, this is uh, with mining in. Uh, I say, what I'm doing in mining in, I've got almost a complete collection of the journals from mining in. And now I've got a, com I'm getting a rather complete collection of the playbills in mining in. I'm entering the playbills, I'm going to compare the information on the playbills with what's in the journals. Let's say they are not always identical. And the interesting thing about the journals is they are published at the end of the season, not at before something takes place. OK, that's a short description of what I'm doing. Uh, it's basically done without any financing whatsoever. I do it all by myself. Do you ever sleep, Paul? <laughs> I haven't told you everything I do. <laughs> OK, thank you very much. So our next speaker is Karen Suni, a lover of both theater and libraries since childhood. Karen Suni has combined the two into her position as curator of the theater collection in the rare books department uh, at the Free Library uh, of Philadelphia. After two years with the Free Library as a librarian in the literature department, she moved to London to complete her second master's in text and performance studies from King's College London, co-taught by the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art. In 2011, she returned to the library to take up her role as curator and as well as a librarian in the rare book department. In her spare time, Karen enjoys travel and reading fiction, as well as cooking, baking, and participating in local food swaps. I can attest she is an amazing baker and cook in general. But now you're going to see what she's cooked up for us today on Theater History. Since I think there are folks here who may not know about the theater collection, I'm absolutely going to take this opportunity to tell you about it. Um, so the theater collection, as mentioned, is housed within the rare book department at the Free Library of Philadelphia. And the name is a little bit of a misnomer um, because while we are a research collection that covers theater with a special focus surprise on Philadelphia and Pennsylvania, um, it also covers film, television, vaudeville, burlesque, circus, radio, puppetry, popular entertainments of almost all kinds. Uh, we don't cover music, we don't cover dance, because we do have a music department in the uh, Central Library who take care of that, and opera is a little spotty. Um, there's a disagreement between me and the music collection about who collects opera, and sometimes that is a no you do, no you do, no you do. Um, <laughs> because neither one of us want to take uh, responsibility for yet another topic. Not that it isn't wonderful, but we're already covering quite a bit. So um, the collection contains uh, over a million items. Um, we have books, magazines, programs, playbills, what, however, in whatever formats you want to call them, uh, scrapbooks, lithographs, clippings, lantern slides, production photos, and more. We have over 8,000 movie posters, over 6,000 lobby cards, over 10,000 film stills and uh, promo photos. Um, it is one of the largest collections of its kind in a public library, hat tip to Billy Rose, uh, who beat us out. Um, but in a public library, I think we're second up um, after them. Um, just a few of the items. We do not have a lot of costume pieces, um, but the photo in the center was a show and tell I was doing, and this uh, headdress comes out every single time I do a uh, show and tell because it's fantastic, and the box that our collection care folks have built for it is a fold-away box, so you can have the box closed and then open the top, and everyone's like, oh my god, what is that? Uh, it's a 1922 um, Ziegfeld Follies headdress worn by Gilda Gray. So 
I'm talking today about our grant proposal that we made to the NEH, but before I can get into the details about that, about the Philadelphia Play Index, I want to talk about um, the two collections that sort of tie into it. The first is our 19th century playbill collection. Um, it has over, over 100,000 playbills in it, um, loose, bound, in scrapbooks. Um, pretty much any way you can have a playbill format is included um, in the Philadelphia, in the uh, 19th century playbill collection. Um, it's primarily Philadelphia. Um, our earliest is 1803. But we also cover um, Boston, New York, Baltimore, London, um, York, a couple of other places in the UK. Um, we're in the process of doing a finding aid for our European historical playbills, um, which is all right now UK because I haven't found anything that is outside of the UK, but I don't want to rule out that I will um, based on the number of boxes that I have. And I will readily admit this, no idea what's in them. Um, none of us like to talk about that, but I sort of shout it from the rooftops because maybe someday that means I'll get more staff. Um, so these are a couple you can see. Similarly, we have rows and rows of these black boxes, what I lovingly call coffin boxes, um, that contain those loose playbills. Um, we do have a finding aid for these. They, um, it was done, thankfully, with Clear and their um, hidden, uh, hidden collections. Uh, there was a processing done before I got to the library, um, well, before I came into my job in the uh, theater collection. It is a box level. Um, it only really covers the Philadelphia collect the playbills, and it is by um, theater than by date. Um, so somewhat limited in people asking, do you have this playbill? Let me pull the box. So for post-19th post century, um, unlike the previous, which is organized by theater, this is organized by show. So, and I always use Mary Wives of Windsor. I've yet to figure out why I do. But every production of Mary Wives, Wives of Windsor that we get a piece of information for, it goes into the Mary Wives of Windsor file. So whether it's from uh, 1900 or 2005, whether it's from San Francisco or Philadelphia, it all goes into the Mary Wives of Windsor file. Um, before we had uh, our space renovated in 2014, the, these files were all housed in 75 filing cabinets, which meant it was incredibly difficult to continue to file new material because when you file, not say by date, which means you could then just keep adding at the end, but instead need to add in the middle, when you have no more room and no more filing cabinets, you just end up with boxes of things. So uh, we gratefully took the opportunity when we had our renovation to move to acid-free uh, document cases with a little bit of room in each and a little bit of room at each, the end of each shelf for some growth um, because people keep producing Hamlet. So <laughs> we need room in the H's. Uh, <laughs> so as you can see, we have approximately 7,000 folders um, in over 600 document cases. It took uh, me and two guys uh, over two weeks to transfer them all from the uh, filing cabinets into these document cases, um, and we are still in the process of changing all of the folders over to acid-free. Um, but as you can imagine, ordering several thousand folders at one time is both budgetary and space-wise uh, a limitation. Um, we also have, in addition to the playbills, clippings, press releases, photographs. Again, anything that relates to that show goes in here. Um, we also have scrapbooks, because scrapbooks, people love scrapbooks. Um, and almost all of these materials are cataloged to an extent in our Philadelphia Play Index. So recognizing the significance of um, Philadelphia theatrical history, the University of Pennsylvania Press um, has published volumes that cover, that list the major productions in Philly from 1749 up to 1855. But there was nothing after that. Um, so in the 1970s, the Free Library, the theater collection of the Free Library, um, got a grant from the William Penn Foundation to build on these volumes, to build this, the uh, Philadelphia Play Index. It contains almost all of the professional productions in Philadelphia from 1855 to 2000. Uh, as you can imagine, the upkeep uh, of the index requires quite a number of labor hours. Um, and so unfortunately, in 2000, when the theater collection lost um, all of its support staff, uh, the index ceased to be updated at that point. 
It is housed in a card catalog, which people really love. Um, and it consists of about 31,500 31, index cards. Um, they contain the typewritten names of plays, the dates, the presenting theaters. In some cases, they also include actors, um, directors, uh, producers. If it has a little P, that usually indicates that we have a program. Um, sometimes it'll say P and even tell me what scrapbook it's in, if it's in a scrapbook. Um, this is the most comprehensive repository of basic information um, about theater, theater activity in Philadelphia um, anywhere. Um, scholars, theater community, uh, family historians, people rely on the index for this kind of vital information um, and as a starting point for what else we may have in the collection. Um, but the problem is, it's in a card catalog. There is no backup. Something happens to this, God forbid, this is all gone. Um, it also is incredibly difficult for searching. <laughs> so if someone asks, uh, you know, how many times, where Mr. Gilbert, Mr. Sullivan, and Mr. Green was produced, I, uh, staff, meaning me, have to go and either take photographs, write down the information, send it on to the patron, or if they happen to be local, maybe we'll be able to pull the drawer and they can come and look at it, which always makes my heart pitter-pat a little bit, again, because there's no backup. It also is only searched by title, and then there are a few drawers that are by theater, producing theater, which then go by date. So if you want to say, hey, can someone calls and can you tell me Wilbur Evans, the shows Wilbur Evans was in, no, I can't. If you tell me uh, the show, I can see if we have information on it. So the project. As you can tell, there needs to be a way. But I'm sure all of us have that thing that you're like, oh, I have lots I want to do in my tenure in this job. But there's one thing. There's one thing. If I can get this thing, I will feel like I have been a success in my job. Getting the Philadelphia Play Index into a front-facing, accessible, searchable database is my one thing. Um, and so we have applied to the NEH for a grant to do that. Um, and it, it consists of two, two stages that sort of work in context. One is extracting the data. Um, so we have decided to go with OCR. Uh, we worked on looking at other options with like Amazon Mechanical Turk or doing, um, you know, our hiring people to do data entry on site. And it was just too complicated and offered too much, needed too much oversight from me, honestly, um, to be able to work that out. So we decided to go with OCR. We are using um, COFAX Total Agility, which if anyone wants to know more about, I'm happy to go into all kinds of details, because I know all kinds of things about OCR now that I never thought I would ever have to know in my job. Um, and part of the reason we chose them is because it is a self-learning system. So every time someone it, you know, runs the OCR and it says, I think this is a G for green. Um, and then the person says, actually, no, that should be for some weird reason, uh, you know, a B. Then it's like, oh, the system was like, okay, well, I'll do that three times. And now I've learned that is a B. I will no longer think that's a G. And so it both increases speed and accuracy and the confidence um, in that, which means verifying the results becomes significantly easier. We're also interested in OCR because we want to see how it works for um, other purposes. I'm sure many of us who work in libraries have uh, information locked in catalog cards like these. And if OCR can work for this, we'd like to see it be able to work for other projects as well. The building the database part, I am not a programmer. I am not a coder. I am not necessarily the person to be able to say how exactly this is going to work um, of building this, which is why we are hiring people uh, to do it. Um, but what we do want to make sure is that um, the metadata is done using Dublin Core in part because we hope to scan our playbills and then include them in the database that's being built with the extracted information. And so since we send all of our images to the Digital Public Library of America, everything has to be done with Dublin Core. And so we're just going to stick with that because as much as we can be consistent across the board, it's better for everyone. Um, and then we'll use mark relator terms in order to sort of indicate when you talk about creator or contributor what exactly they created or contributed to, uh, to the system. And then the front end is really important with this input form. Because this, to me, is honestly the second most important piece to this whole thing. 
Because as I said, it ends in 2000. And there is no way with me alone, even if I had a team, well, if I had a team giant enough, but uh, with a team that the library could afford, uh, there is no way that I could bring this up to date and keep it current. And so what I want to do is leverage the Philadelphia theater community to help me do that. And so there will be an input form where anyone, a practitioner, a audience member, a researcher, anyone who finds out about a show that we don't have listed in the index or information about a show that we don't have listed in the index can input that information into the form, which then gets verified by us and then goes live into the database. So it's a way to bring from 2000 up to now um, because it's very sad how much we are losing in being able to keep track of what's happening in the Philadelphia theater community now which ends a certain, allows a certain amount of flexibility. We have to be able to change and grow with how things go. The sustainability is an, is an active question, um, and we hope to be sustainable through the growth of um, both the input and in building in flexibility automatically. Just a few numbers. I won't read them all out because you all can read, uh, <laughs> but it gives you an idea of what we're talking about. Um, these are all approximate. I basically took a drawer and counted all of the data points. That was an interesting afternoon. Um, and so next steps. Obviously, I mentioned we're going to scan the playbills. We want to add those images to the database. We want to build on Penn's project and other projects that are out there um, that Doug sort of talked about in the idea of building uh, the, a transcription project. But what it does is to enhance the database so that then all feeds that information into the database we built that's based off of the play index. Um, we also want to connect this with other institutions that are doing similar things. Obviously, you have to make things, you know, information talk to each other, which is always an interesting process. But, um, and then, honestly, I want to do an exhibition that highlights that. Um, one of the things we don't talk about enough, in my opinion, is the behind the scenes stuff that happens um, in what we do. Uh, that being able to see the scan lab, being able to not even to bring the scan lab to the exhibition floor that people can participate in the process of scanning, of processing images, of having um, the ability to sit and transcribe there on site, um, and really giving people an opportunity to see how that all works um, and, uh, and to really be a part of it. Because the more we can bring the people in, um, the more we can get them to uh, participate, the faster, the better, the easier this will all go. So that is the quick and dirty rundown. Uh, so we will know in March. Um, so I hope, if all goes well, that I can count on you all to support uh, this when entering in information, if you find out that we're missing stuff, um, into the Philadelphia Play Index once it is up and running. So thank you.